stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. We share stories for many reasons, to persuade, to entertain, to connect. What we sometimes forget is the impact of the stories we tell ourselves. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, how you share them makes a difference in how you remember them and in how you're perceived by the people you're interacting with. When you figure out which stories to share, difficult bosses and coworkers, successes, failures, the next step is to develop how you share them. Have you figured out your patterns, your roles in those successes, the discomfort and your challenges? In this series, you'll hear stories that will resonate with you. You'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into the lessons from each of those. How many times have you been sharing a story only to be interrupted by a person eager to share his own? When I'm working with clients on communication skills, I remind them to listen for understanding, not to respond. But during this podcast, I'm asking you to listen and consider your own related stories, to listen and consider which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. Today, we're going to um, have another special treat of a road trip podcast episode, this time with my friend Amber Johnson. And as the other um, episodes in this series, this is another one along the theme of resilience. So um, I'd like to introduce Amber as a friend of mine from here in Helena, Montana, and she is currently in 2019 the vice president of the Women's Leadership Network. And um, the first question I always ask my guests is to please share something about yourself that other people might not know. They wouldn't find it on a bio. Um, they wouldn't see it on a LinkedIn profile. You know, one of those things that maybe came from your childhood that other people that know you now might not know. So what do you think, Amber? Do you have something you could share? Um, you know, I guess something that is always kind of unique to share is that I lived on a very small Caribbean island, worked as a teacher and an aid worker on a couple of different occasions, and that was a pretty unique life experience that, you know, just bumping into me here in Helena, Montana, most people probably wouldn't uh, be familiar with and would be quite surprised to know. I think that's a good one. I, I think I knew that to some extent, but um, only because we've talked about travel so much and the, our common, our mutual love for travel. I do love travel and I do love road trips. So I am very happy to be here on a road trip podcast. <laughs> Do you want to tell people where we are road tripping to and why? Sure. Well, you you initiated it, so That's you right. tell the story. It is the exotic, exotic destination of Great Falls, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Famous maybe for the Corp Discovery Lewis and Clark expedition, but and the, possibly the Sip and Dip Tiki Lounge, but I'm not sure what else. Well, the Sip and Dip is nationally recognized as a place not to miss across the U.S. They say it is the number one bar worth flying for by GQ. And they do have um, mermaids that swim in a tank right adjacent to the bar, so you can see them when you're ordering your drink from the bartender. And I would hate to disappoint people, but they are not real mermaids. Oh, Amber. Yeah, they're like, they're like human mermaids. Oh, you're not supposed to tell people that. I, I think my biggest disappointment when I saw them the first time was that they were wearing goggles. <laughs> right, right. Uh, no, but they're pretty, pretty excellent. So maybe we can, uh, maybe we can go to the sip and dip later. Yes. So Amber invited me to go see the band Pink Martini in Great Falls, and I realized this would be a perfect opportunity for us to talk about resilience because she has a pretty unique story in terms of what she experienced and her ability to not only survive difficulty and traumatic experience, but also to, to thrive, which I think is the difference between survival and resilience. Yes, survival and resilience, I think, are two very different things. To exist in misery is not to overcome and thrive despite the circumstances. Exactly. And there are a lot of people who exist in misery, and I want more for my life than that. Exactly. So um, tell me just a little bit about um, kind of where you were when you you know, the story of why you had to be resilient. You know, I, I, I guess I've had 
various seasons or circumstances in life that have required me to survive, one. Um, but I, as I mentioned, I just wanted more from my life than survival. Um, so that required me to survive, one, which is the first step. And then you kind of have to make this decision that you're going to do more than just survive. And I've had a couple few of those kind of turning points or, you know, forks in the road. I call it a pivot. A pivot. Yeah, and I, I can recognize at least a solid couple points in my life when I've had to make the decision not to be destroyed by my circumstances, or maybe that's not even the right word. Like, I was destroyed by my circumstances, but it's making the decision to then... I like to say that, you know, I, I came to that pivot, that um, point in the road where I had to decide to grow something beautiful from the black, rich soil of my suffering because there is nothing more fertile as far as soil is concerned than ash. And once you're destroyed and in your life, as you know, it has burnt to the ground, you can exist in misery or you can start planting and you can start growing and after a very long while, you can start thriving. Right. And, you know, that just reminded me so strongly of, a, of an image I have. Um, I worked with the city of Helena here when we were doing some mitigation work on dead and, and dying trees in the forest surrounding Helena in particular in our watershed. And I learned so much in the couple of years that I was working on projects with the Forest Service um, through their scientists that basically said that there are some trees that won't propagate unless they're burned first. Mm, yeah. Like lodgepole pine, once they drop their needles or drop their cones, they actually have to have an extreme experience sure. before they'll open and, and be fertilized. I have learned to call that, quote unquote, the severe mercy of God. <laughs> <laughs> Be okay. they man-made or natural forces, right, that burn the forest to the ground. To some extent, you know, what is left over is pretty brown and ugly and burnt. For a while. For a while. But um, it really is sometimes, often, well, especially for the forest, obviously, um, is an essential part. Of the continued health of a forest. I, I don't necessarily advocate trauma as some kind of, you know, like growth experiment for the human being. I mean, you know, if 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 we can protect ourselves and others from from terrible trauma, if we can, fantastic. But so often, unexpected you know, life circumstances, no matter how hard you try to protect yourself or others, is just going to, you know, keep that uh, hope and dream kind of out of reach. I mean, the it's just a human condition, you know, trauma, of, you know, varying severity, you know, disappointment, sorrow, grief. I mean, it is part of the human experience. And I think it's just a matter of trying to realize that you cannot exist in that human experience alone. Like, if your entire human existence and experience is only and always about your trauma and your grief and your sorrow, then you exist in misery. But it's being able to carve out, you know, beauty and joy and connection, you know, in the midst of it. Uh, and you know, and then because of it. You know, I also see, um, I see struggle and not necessarily trauma because there's something specific about trauma, but I see struggle as such a relative thing that um, for somebody Absolutely. who hasn't had the same experiences of uh, childhood trauma, abuse, rape, um, abusive relationships, um, a severe diagnosis, somebody who hasn't experienced that, it doesn't mean that they haven't felt like their world had burned to the ground. And so um, I, I see that resilience for everyone, regardless of the, the type of experience they had that was traumatic or stressful or felt like it was completely over. 
absolutely. I think that, um, quote unquote, trauma or struggle, you know, whatever you word you want to use for, you know, the human experience of trouble. Uh, I think it is relative. One of my favorite proverbs is that, um, uh, each heart knows its own bitterness and no one else can share in its joy. Yes, we are in relationship with other human beings, which makes life hundred percent better. But at the end of the day, like your journey is your own. And, and as much as you can be, you know, in an intimate, you know, you know, relationship with friends and lovers and family at the end of the day, at the end of life, really your story is your own. And as much as you are wanting and willing to share that story with someone else, they're never going to know the depths of your sorrow and your bitterness. They are never going to understand the heights of your joy. It's kind of really, I think something very personal that is, uh, you know, can only be related between the self and its creator. So, um, I know you don't want to get into a whole lot of detail, but when you think about a specific pivot point, can you tell us just a little bit of context about that and then share basically that, that moment or that series of experiences that made you realize that you were resilient and that you were going to be okay? Sure. Um, I mean, I have a, a couple, a couple of experiences. I'll share one with you. Um, I mean, many terrible things coalesced into probably the longest, you know, season of my life. Um, by far the most traumatic, uh, and, and unemployment was a big part of that. I mean, it was just a piece of it. Um, but it was a big piece because there's something healing about being able to get up and, and go to a job, right? Um, and basically make a living so that you can provide shelter and food for yourself. So, um, I would say that I was having this conversation. I wouldn't call it a conversation as much as a cry fest over the phone with my friend Paul. And I mean, I was, I was miserable. How long had you been unemployed at this point or underemployed? Um, probably at this point, um, like a year and a half. That's significant. It's, it's significant. And I really was at a place where I wasn't sure life was ever going to get any better. And I mean, I was crying to my friend Paul over the phone and he was kind to me and he listened to me, but he said, Amber, no one is coming to your rescue. And I know that sounds a bit harsh. Uh, and maybe for someone else, that's maybe not what they wanted or needed to hear. But for me in that moment, I needed to take responsibility slash, like I needed just, I kind of that kick in the pants, you know, that tough love to kind of almost challenge me to save myself. Yeah. And I would say in that moment, it's like I stopped crying. You know, I dried my eyes and I began to think about the future as some kind of like almost challenge to overcome or some kind of adventure, like a mountain to be climbed. And that very next day I started the process of basically deciding who I was, what I wanted in my life, you know, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. Um, who I wanted to be. I think up until that moment, I wasn't ready for that yet. You know, I had been a year and a half of crying, weeping and every grieving. day and grieving. grieving and, you know, with sorrow and trauma, um, compounded by unemployment. And it took me a year and a half of weeping every day. I think before I was able to really receive that kick in the pants that I needed to move on with my life. Exactly. So you may have even heard that message from somebody else to a certain extent, but either it was the wrong time or the wrong messenger, or they didn't say it in a way that you would be able to absorb. But when you were ready, you heard it loud and clear. Correct. I think that's a, a really important aspect of resilience to, first of all, to give yourself that grace of time 
when you look back, not facing regret for having done it, having not done it sooner, um, but understanding and uh, again giving yourself that grace of time for grief. Sure. And then making sure that um, that that next aspect of resilience is taking the time to decide what you want. How? What impact do you want to have? What kind of life do you want to live? And and what are the first steps to get there? And there's really nothing more empowering that I've done for myself or resilient than make the choice to rescue myself. Because there's this rescue fantasy that I think in particular is fed to women, be it through, you know, Disney movies or religion. There's this real concept of, you know, this very strong, dominant male figure that comes to your rescue and is going to save you from fill in the blank. Well, especially in previous generations, older generations, where um, mothers said to daughters, you need to find a rich man. And my mom actually said those words. She said, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich man as a poor man. And I remember thinking, well, why do I need that? Why do I need any man? Sure. Um, you know, that is not to say that, you know, you know, relationships, you know, be they romantic or otherwise aren't valuable, but being able to take ownership for my own life in the sense that, you know, if I was going to dig myself out of the hole, I mean, I don't think I did it alone. No, I'm not going to take like, oh, I support, you know, like bang on my chest and, you know, say that, without the help of other people, I managed to overcome and thrive on my own because I don't think anyone can. I mean, it really took my friend Paul St. Amber. No one's coming to your rescue. I needed him to say that to me. I needed another person to say that to me. But really, a lot of the effort and the commitment and the time, it really was required of me to do for myself that no one else, you know, could do for me. So it was, you know, I think that was a key to my resilience was, was not looking to other people, Uh you know, to provide me this or provide me that. Um, but it was really making a commitment to myself to overcome and to thrive. That reminds me of part of the conversation that I had with Andy Amundsen, which was the first of this series in resilience, which was how we find resilience comes from so many different places. And for her, finding resilience was realizing the responsibility to the people in her life that were counting on her. And, and that was her internal strength. That's where that came from. I have to not only survive, I have to be a role model. I have to make sure that my children are cared for. And so she really, and even as a young adult, when she was taking care of her younger siblings, it wasn't, that resilience didn't necessarily come from um, an internal need to care for herself. It was an internal need to care for others. And then for me, I realized that when I was going through difficulties, I found my resilience in my community. I found that because I had committed to helping others in my community before I needed it myself, that I knew that I had this whole support network when I needed them. And now you're saying, you know, your resilience came from the desire and need for that satisfaction of taking care of yourself and committing to not only taking care of yourself, but taking care of yourself in a way that you were meeting your goals, your needs, and your ultimate desires. I would, uh, yeah, I would say that is correct. I mean, I had lived so much of my life as I have lived so much of my life as a gypsy that wherever I move and wherever I go, I, I could unfortunately tell you that community has varied in its strength. Mm-hmm. Like I've been in places um, that I have found community quickly and been surrounded by people that love me and support me. But I've also been in places where I have not, you know, a single friend within stone's throwing distance. And I have to manage to wake up and put one foot in front of the other, you know, not because somebody is urging me along, but just because I want to be more than a statistic. I want to be more than a sad story. That reminds me of your trip to Cuba. 
Mm. And that last minute cancellation of your travel partner. And I remember in those first couple of days that you were there and I would see these Facebook posts about being lonely. And um, what I'm finding interesting is this kind of combination of finding your strength because you knew what you wanted out of the trip. And after a couple of days, you decided you were going to get what you wanted out of the trip. And in that same breath, you figured out how to meet the people that you needed to, that you wanted to be part of that story. Sure. That's so cool. <laughs> you know, I think it is, I love, uh, I love to cook. I love to cook. And I love metaphors. Maybe it's partly because I had a college professor who is obsessed with metaphors. And so he has since passed on the obsession to me. And, you know, we talked about, you know, fires and the forest service and, you know, ash and growing beautiful things out of, um, you know, a burnt area. I also think of like, there's like this, uh, famous little, I don't know, cooking show called Chopped, and it's like a mystery box right. where you like open up this mystery box to find four mystery ingredients, and then you have to like somehow take these really odd, maybe not by themselves overly tasty ingredients, and you have to put them together in such a way that you create some, you know magical cooking experiment with them. I like that show too. And I feel in some ways like that is really how you find resilience and you can like succeed and thrive in life. It's like, who knows what's around the corner. And like, I think that for most of us could say that life is not panned out or ended up like we had imagined. Right. And whether by our own choices or acts of nature or coincidence or chance or misfortune or, you know, even blessing. Like, I think that life is quite the mystery, just like that mystery box. And like, uh, I feel like every season of our life, we like open the mystery box and find something unexpected. Uh -huh. And so it's a matter of like taking those ingredients that you have in the moment and you're like, well, this is gross. Like, who <laughs> who would want Put circus peanuts? Right? In, in who would entree? want to cook with this? <laughs> it's a matter of like opening your mystery box. You know, the unexpected that happens to you at the last minute that might not be what you planned. It might not be what you hoped. And then you begin to just use what you have. And you create something special and delectable out of it. So you can even add to that little analogy, that big analogy, that in some cases you have some experience with a few of the ingredients in that box. You may not have experience in creating something savory like an entree with something like circus peanuts, but you've had experience of using something that's sweet in a savory dish. Sure. So you have that ability to use your past experience to be able to make something beautiful out of something that maybe came in as unexpected or what you might have originally considered to be ugly or gross. Absolutely. I, I mean, enough trips around the sun and you begin to learn things. And I guess yeah, the challenge, so. right, is not just to learn, but to like retain the lesson. Um, maybe sometimes we have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again, but hopefully not. Well, some of us more than others. Right. Some of us more than speaking others. from experience. <laughs> so I do think that resilience is definitely like a muscle group, right? That you have to exercise consistently so that, you know, when you're confronted with a situation that requires you to do a bit of power lifting, you know, in order to, you know, you know, lift, you know, or get over, um, the obstacle. I, I think with more or practice, think obviously through a, a work around. Right. Yeah. So it, I think resilience is kind of like a muscle and the more you use it, you know, the more, you know, the more strength you have to, um, take some unfortunate news or circumstances and survive it you know, overcome it and then create something tasty out of, you know, unexpected or unwanted ingredients. And it really comes back to one of the first things you said as we kind of wrap up the discussion, which was that you made a conscious choice that you didn't want to just survive 
that you there was more in your life that you wanted out of it and that it was up to you to find it. Yeah, like I think it's making that decision that I do not want to be defined by a sad story. I think that's obviously the challenge of sharing these really difficult stories, right? It's because they're sad and they're hard and they're difficult. And sometimes we don't get beyond that. Um, you know, as we plan this resiliency conference for the Women's Leadership Network, you know, in October of 2019, I'm really excited about what we're going to building, what we're calling the celebration forum. It's like not getting caught up in the sad story alone. I mean, right. it's it's part of the recipe, obviously. You have to acknowledge it. Absolutely. And, and it has see to be where it's impacting your, your, right. your methods and your way of thinking. But you have to move beyond that to like, okay, when did I know I was going to be okay? You know, what was that moment or moments? What are the lessons I've been able to apply? Right. And, you know, what tools did I use to overcome and thrive? And, you know, what did people do along the way to, to help me, you know, overcome and succeed? And, I mean, I definitely have spent a lifetime accumulating, you know, information about myself that helps me you know, navigate hard times. And, uh, I mean, it's everything from sunshine. I've discovered that I need sunshine in the form, like I need to be outside every day in some way or another. So I walk to work, I walk home from work, I walk, you know, at work during breaks, rain, shine, sub-zero temperatures. I need fresh air. I need sunshine. It's one of the things, it's, it's, it's a really profound type of medicine that I have used for going on 10 years now that I just really cannot live without. Yep, and it's all really, when it comes to resilience, as much as you may find that your resilience comes from your sense of responsibility to others, you, you must practice self-care. Otherwise, that responsibility to others is going to be lost. I mean, and self-care looks very different from person to person. Um, you have to find out what it is. That, and you do. It, for you. And honestly, yeah. it's like, call it uh, wisdom that you accumulate, you yeah. know, with age. I, I think that we all look back at our 20s and are like, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, and when you think about how you find your self-care, the method that works best for you, the way that I go about doing that, because it changes over the years, sure, sure. How, where I'm going to find that satisfaction, is um, I really consider, instead of just looking at struggle as a time for learning lessons, I also look at when I was really thriving, when things were going really well for me, what are some of the activities I was doing mm, that made me right. feel good? And, and so you can start to see patterns Absolutely. like, oh, well, when I was walking every day, I really felt good about myself. Sure. And I think that's, it's one of the, the key components to lessening the severity of future disappointment, trauma, hardship is learning to live every day. Uh, with health and wellness and beauty and joy because really those are the it's I mean debriefing trauma is different than building resilience into your bones and I don't think you yes do you build resilience as you overcome hard times yes but I really think it's during the down times it's like during those you know seasons of wellness and peace that we really need to invest in yes. joy and we need to Instead of invest for something in happen. relationship right. and we need to invest um, in you know the things that bring us joy the things that bring us laughter because those it's almost like storing up if you yeah. it's like because it's not a matter of if but when it's part of the human condition people will struggle you know life is not easy um, I mean, it might be easier for some than others, but for everyone, if you're human, you will struggle, you will cry, you will be disappointed and everybody carries with them, you know, some form of trauma, you know, 
and the severity might be different from person to person, but no one is immune. There, it's part of the human condition, and so I think it's a resiliency, the way to prepare for those hard times is to just really embrace and celebrate uh, and when store up. Good, right? You know, like right. when times are good, like suck the marrow out of the bones, <laughs> lick the plate clean, exactly. you know, dance when no one is watching. It kind of reminds me of when I tell people that um, you really don't want to wait till you need your network to build your network. Sure. So in times where you are comfortable in your skin, in times when you are feeling some level of satisfaction, you build in that that time to enjoy it, but also to build the community that you might need or to understand yourself better so that when something happens, you know what tools to use. And yeah, I, I think that's such an important aspect and I hadn't really put that together. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. I mean, really, we need people. I mean, Barbara Streisand, you know, she's saying it. Yes, people, people who need people are the luckiest people. Uh-huh. Um, and that is, we all need people. And so being able to foster genuine, beautiful relationships with friends and with family on a consistent basis is is really the key to wellness so that when hard times come, you know, you have that support and built-in community. And, and you know, not all of them are going to step up to the plate. And I think that's a, a hard... A hard truth. It's a hard truth because whether someone is dealing with their own disappointment, trauma, struggle, and they just have no capacity to really share your burden, um, or whether they're just completely terrified of anything that, you know, just strays beyond normalcy. It can be really disappointing when they don't show up. It's incredibly disappointing to some extent. I mean, in studying trauma um, and recovery, Sometimes the greatest wounds don't come from, like, a perpetrator, you know, but they come from the people who don't show up for you. Exactly. And, and again, that goes back to, one, yes, we need people, but at the end of the day, our story is our own. And so you're going to have to just find this inner bulldog. You know, I, uh, I mean, I'm part bulldog and maybe that's why I've been able to, you know, overcome and thrive is because I had to like, you know, bite down, you know, and say, you know, whether or not anyone steps up to the plate and they have, I, I have what I call, you know, mini heroes that I can identify. Uh, I wouldn't say that one person has like, you know, you know, stepped in, filled that rescue fantasy because I don't really think really anybody does, but I can identify those, those, you know, small heroes and champions in my life that have really made a difference. Um, and it's, you know, it's as simple as, asking if you want to go on a walk or, you know, taking you to a yoga class or taking you sledding or cooking you a good meal or just sending you a text in the middle of the day with smiley faces saying, I'm thinking about you. Exactly. And so, yes, we need people. Yes, we need to, you know, invest in our community daily so that when push comes to shove, you know, we have people to fall back on. And two, when you fall back on people and they don't catch you, you have to hit the ground and it's going to hurt and it's going to be incredibly disappointing, but you have to find your inner bulldog that says, I am more than just a sad story. And, and you clamp down on that, I guess, I don't know, determination or stubbornness. And, and you begin to say that, yes, I need people, but you know, this is my story and I will make it my own and I'm going to rescue myself. And we know from studies of uh, neuroscience that what we focus on is what we see. So if we choose to only see those sad stories, that's what we're going to see, if that's what we're focused on. But if we see those sad stories and we see how we got out of it, we look for the good stuff. It's just that's the nature of our brain. Sure. We prime it. Whatever we focus on is what we're going to see. And I do think that being able to look for and see the good stuff will vary on where you are in your healing journey. Because somebody who's freshly traumatized, you know, and in, and incredibly depressed is not going to be able to see the good stuff. 
And, you know, it might be a month. It might be six months. It might be a year. It might be a year and a half. It might be two years. Like, there's no prescription for how long your grief gets to last. Um, I mean, my grief lasted, like, my intense, terrible, can't-see-any-good-stuff grief lasted for a year and a half. It's a very long time to, like, wake up and go to sleep every day weeping. And, I mean... I, uh, but I'm so far beyond that. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying I don't cry, but I cry very rarely. And I think back to that time of my life when I wept every day for a year and a half. And, uh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. You know, I can't even, but I can't, almost, I can't even recognize that person, that person or that self who went through that because I have, you know, so transformed. And it's, yeah, it is a it is a long, difficult, and yet beautiful journey. We wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> well, maybe we would. Well, maybe we would. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, thank you so much for talking to me about this today. Um, I, you know, I love road trips, so this is kind of a perfect combination of conversation and road trip and. There were definitely some pieces of that that I hadn't really considered before, and I just love, the, first of all, learning more about you and how you think, but I also love that we can talk about things that might have some application for others that are experiencing difficulty right now or that will experience it later. Maybe something will trigger a memory from this conversation, and they'll say, I'm going to choose myself today. Absolutely. I you know, I hope that whatever listeners are, you know, l- listening to this, that they find some empowerment and some hope. And, and if I could tell your listeners what my friend Paul told me, you know, a few years ago is that, you know, it's coming to your rescue, you know, and what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Share Them Will. Please visit my website for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and information about how I can help you develop and share your stories at elkinsconsulting.com. Could you tell me that you're going